good evening. Glad to be back with you all again this uh, afternoon, early evening. I've had a really enjoyable day, a fun day. Glad to have been up here and to have gotten the opportunity to meet and speak to uh, several of you up here and your your hospitality and your friendliness has been beyond what I would have expected to come and I've always received warm welcome seems like everywhere I've ever been to a congregation of the Lord's people but you people have just about gone far beyond and surpassed most of what I've seen in, in many places and it's been so good to be able to see Brandon and Erica and their children today and to spend a little time with them I spoke a little bit earlier today about you know absence uh, makes the heart grow fonder and We've been apart for a pretty long while now. Don't, have, don't see Brandon very often. And so it was very good to, to get to spend some time with them and, and to get a little reacquainted on some things. And I'll be honest with you, Stephanie said, you know, I was, I was sitting down talking with Erica, and these are her words, and she said it was almost just like we were still at Memphis. had never left the place, you know. And that's honestly the way I felt being able to talk with, with Brandon today. But that's enough small talk for me. And no, I'm not going to take the opportunity to tell any embarrassing stories in regards to Brandon because he'll have the opportunity to get the last word. And so I, I've learned my lesson in the past. It's sometimes best just to just to keep quiet and keep certain things to yourself. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's because I love you, too. Now, you know that, right? OK. All right. So as we begin tonight, I wanted to begin by asking a question. How many of us have made what we might call a life-changing or a life-altering decision. I think most everyone in here probably would. Hey, just stop and think about it from the standpoint. How many of you are married? Yeah, that was a pretty life-altering decision, wasn't it? And by the looks of the number of children that were in here, I would assume many of you have children as well. Now, you talk about really changing things now. <laughs> They're all his. Okay, all right. I, I hope you put in for a raise, brother. <laughs> oh, but, you know, these are seriously very life-altering events. I was 26, married, uh, turned 27 when Stephanie had our first child, and, and things were never the same. And they were especially never the same for her, you know, bless her heart, especially having to deal with me also. But even as much of a change as that brought in my life, nothing has brought more of a change to who I am and what I determined to do with the rest of my life than when I became a Christian. And I would dare say it's the same for all of you in here today who profess to be followers or disciples of Jesus Christ. Because, friends, if we're being serious about it, when we become a Christian, that is a commitment. And I'm talking about a serious commitment that we either know is so much at that time. If not, we grow to know and to learn and to understand that we're no longer the people whom we used to be. I know the Bible describes that in many different ways, talking about the fact that we are a new creature, a new creation in Christ, or we bury our old man in the waters of baptism and rise up to walk in newness of life, Paul talks about in the book of Romans. But it, they're being serious. It's absolutely, it is a major change that we go through. And it's not like getting a free trial membership to the gym where we go run on the treadmill for 15 minutes and go, hey, this ain't for me, and then go back home and never darken the doors of the place again. No, Christianity is a serious commitment. You know, I think about some of the words that the Lord had to say in regards to that. He talked about the fact that man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back he said, he's not worthy of the kingdom. In other words, if you start down plowing that row and you decide you want to turn back and let go of it, you can't be my disciple. That's basically what he is saying here at this point in time. Similarly, in other instances in the parables, he talked about the fact of counting the cost. He gave two different ones where he talked about the man. He said, who's the man that's going to build a tower and he doesn't sit down first and figure out if he's got enough to be able to do it, enough money, enough time, whatever it might be. Now, I've thought before in the past, my wife, she's from Barrie, which is a little ways off, and we used to drive from Fett to Barrie, and there was a man who started building a house, and he got it framed up, got it what we call blacked in, got it weather tight, weatherproof, and then he stopped. Never finished the house. I don't know why. I don't know what happened. Don't know anything about the man, but I always thought about this, what Jesus said every time I ride by, and it's still there. I still see the place on occasion but he also talked about that the other example with the king going to war in other words if you're going to make a decision 
as serious as what this is, he says, you need to stop and make sure that you are going to be able to do it. Because he talked about the fact, he said, if you are not willing to forsake all, in other words, to put me in a position of supremacy in your life to be number one, he says, you're not worthy or you cannot be my disciple. And friends, I'm afraid some people fail to recognize the significance or the serious nature of this commitment when they become Christians. And, and a lot of people, don't get me wrong, they grow to realize and to understand over time. But there are some, though, seriously, I think that becoming a Christian is more of a matter of convenience rather than a matter of conviction. And if that be the case, we're in dangerous territory, especially in regards to that, what we're looking about or thinking about today, because the life of a Christian is supposed to be about sacrifice and about service. It's not about convenience or, or what can be done for me. No, it's the exact opposite of that. You know, you just think about this DBS tonight. You see all these children and all the people who are going to be teaching and all the decorating and the work and the food and all the things that took place. It's fun, right? Yeah, it is. It's as much fun for me as an adult to be at VBS as it is for the young people, I think, sometimes. And granted, I don't get to go to their classes and do the arts and crafts and any of that, but I do like to sing when the children are singing. And it's always a lot of fun, but VBS is hard work, isn't it? To get everything ready to do the things of which you're doing here tonight. But you've got people that are committed to it, who love to do it and they invest their time we talked a little bit about that earlier today and friends they they desire to do these very things and i guarantee you like most places that you go to when you talk about vbs you probably got your quote unquote vbs people here that that's what they look forward to every year we've got them back home at eldridge i know that that's it when it starts getting close to time they start getting excited and so they want to get everybody else excited and that's good it helps, but you can look at it from the same as that for people that perhaps go out and do visitation, those who do the cooking, Bible class teachers. You have certain people that are known for certain characteristics in the church, but they all generally seem to focus around an idea of service. But with service also comes that sacrifice, but they are the people that get things done. And that's the attitude that one must possess the same type of spirit if we are going to be successful at evangelism. And that's what the topic that was given to me tonight is dealing with, evangelism being as dedicated as possible, or excuse me, as the apostles. Now, friends, I'll tell you something. Uh, when they first gave me this subject, I thought, okay. But the more I thought about it, I was like, man, that's, that's something really to think about. You, we were talking about life-changing decisions earlier. Think about what's recorded in Luke chapter 5 in those first 11 verses there where Jesus, he's at Lake Gennesaret and he's there and he's going to speak and the people are all pressed around a big crowd and so he gets in Peter's boat. He says, you know, put it aside a little bit where I can get away, get some distance where we can speak and they can hear me. And of course, after he gets done speaking, he asks Peter to take his boat on out a little farther. They've already worked all night. Didn't catch any fish, he said, but Jesus said, won't you take it out and, and let your nets down for another draw, another draw one time. And to Peter, of course, saying, Lord, we worked all night, didn't catch anything, but okay, we'll go. And so he goes, and what happens? Well, of course, there's so many fish, they can't even drag the, drag the net up. So he calls his partners, James and John, they come out there, and they begin to drag all these fish out and fill their boats up so much that they're about to sink. And what does Peter say? Lord, get away from me. I'm just a sinful man. But Jesus told him something then at that point in time. He says, you know, Simon, he said, you come with me. He said, and I'm going to make you a fisher of men from this point forward. And what did he do? When they brought those boats back into shore, it says they forsook everything. Forsook it all and began to follow Jesus. You know, friends, when I think about the things in which the apostles sacrificed in order to follow the mission that Jesus gave to them, I don't know that I can sit up here in a pulpit or stand up here in a pulpit and tell you, yeah, this is what you're fixing to have to do or explain to you how it is that you should do exactly as them. Because, friends, they had set a standard or a bar at a level at which I would be embarrassed to try to reach myself. 
And so I don't think it would be proper for me to try to tell you sitting there in the pew that you should do something that I don't feel that I'm able to do. I'm not saying it's wrong and I'm not trying to avoid the subject, but friends, I wanted to look at it from perhaps what I would consider, and maybe this is the wrong way to say it, but a more perhaps realistic way of looking at this and adopting some of the attitudes or the principles in which they had in carrying out their mission. And so that's what I want us to look at tonight in thinking about being dedicated like the apostles. And I wanted to look at one man in particular and study some aspects of his life just because of the fact that perhaps more is written about him as an apostle in the New Testament than anyone else, and that's the Apostle Paul. And so I want to look at a few of the qualities that he possessed that allowed him to be so successful in regards to evangelism. And the first thing is the fact that Paul was determined, or he made that determination that he was going to live for Christ. If you're familiar with the history of Paul, which I'm sure many of you are, you know that it was on the road to Damascus that Jesus uh, Jesus first appeared to him or spoke to him and changed the whole course of his life. Because prior to this point in time, what was Paul known for? Well, he was the most severe persecutor of the church that perhaps the world knew at that point in time. But it was on that road to Damascus, it says. And, and you see there beginning in verse number one that he was, you know, threatening the church and he was causing trouble for the church. And he received letters of the high priest to go to Damascus. And that's why he was on that road to Damascus. Of course, he, he saw that light and the Lord spoke to him and he fell down to the earth. And, and the Lord spoke and Jesus asked him, he said, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, of course, didn't know who he was, but then he revealed himself unto him. Now, he was going on his way to persecute more Christians in the city of Damascus. And I think it's oftentimes, or I find it ironic, that here's a man who is perhaps the greatest persecutor of the church who eventually becomes arguably the greatest evangelist in which the church knows of over any point in time of, its own, of the church's history. Now, from his own admission, I find it interesting that Paul talks about the fact of, of how, and oftentimes with great remorse, this that he did in going about persecuting the church. But I also think about it from the standpoint that, well, what was Paul's background prior to this? What motivated him to act this way? And a lot of it was due to the fact of things in which he saw. You know, when he was coming up or he was a young man, he was a witness to the martyrdom of Stephen. He was there. He, he attests to this as fact in his own self or his own confession there in Acts 22 we read about. He said, I was there when they killed Stephen. And he said, I, you know, I assented. I, I agreed with it. I consented there unto his death. And, you know, we also have to consider that the things in which he did, he did according to the authority that was given to him by the chief priests at that point in time. They allowed him or, or gave him the thoughts or the the ability to go about and to do these very things. And that's why he was able to say that the things he did all throughout the course of his life was he did so with a good conscience before God all that time. In other words, he never doubted the things in which he was doing was right. However, once he came to a knowledge of the truth, all of that changed and nothing was the same for him going forward because he repented and he turned his life over to Jesus, the only one through whom true salvation and an eternity with God was going to be possible. And so he accepted that forgiveness. He accepted the salvation and the life in which he had been given or the new opportunity for life with great purpose. He did not hide in shame. He didn't think, well, because of all the things I've done in my past, I'm not really worthy to go out there and to talk to people about Jesus because of the way in which I've done. And I make mention of this because I've met people before in the past and perhaps even in my own mind sometimes early on, I, was, I felt a little bit of shame and, and was nervous about talking to people about the Lord because I knew what kind of life that I had lived prior to becoming a Christian. And so I put this up here, Paul, things that you, I'm sure most of you are all familiar with just to state the fact that here was a man and by all Paul's own admission that probably nobody could have been worse toward Christ than what he was. But yet he turned into a great evangelist and a powerful evangelist himself. You know, he set out to, on a path to be a worker for the Lord and he worked hard. His letter to the Corinthians, he talked about the fact how he were outworked all of his contemporaries. Not that he was bragging, but he was telling 
the truth. Paul, from that point onward, from when he was converted until he was martyred, some people guess probably around 30 or a little over 30 years, he lived his life for the Lord. Not his own personal desires anymore. Galatians 2.20, that famous verse, he said, I am crucified with Christ. In other words, I have put my own personal selfish desires behind me. I've put them in the grave. My life is now focused on living for the Lord. And going about his motivation then was to tell other people about Jesus. Now, granted, there are some differences between us and Paul back in that day and time, but friends, can we not do the same thing that Paul did? And I say the answer is yes, and I say it with very strong conviction. You know, we may not have the level of education that Paul did. We talked about that some earlier today and even talked about education in general. We may not have the miraculous gifts of an apostle that he did, but we still share in the same gift of salvation that was available to him is still available to us today. The greatest gift that has ever been offered unto the world. And friends, guess what? We still have access to the very same knowledge that Paul had. He talked about that in the book of Ephesians. He's writing there to the brethren in Ephesus, and he says, if you've heard of that which has been given to me by God towards you, he talks about the fact of how it had been revealed to him, that mystery, talking about the church. He said here, notice where it's highlighted. He says, when you read what I've written, he said, you can understand what my knowledge is regarding the mystery of Christ. And this is a, a very concise version of it. He says, it was hid at one point in time, he said, but now it's been revealed to us and we've revealed it unto you. And to sum it up, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and part of the same body, talking about the church, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And friends, when you talk about evangelizing, that's exactly what it is all about, is spreading the gospel, the message, the good news, we sometimes call it, concerning Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and ultimately one day his coming back to receive his people and to take them unto heaven. Now, granted, we don't get it in the miraculous means. We've got to study if, we've gone, if we're going to be able to do that. It's one reason we talked about education this morning. Many of you are familiar with these verses that Paul had written to Timothy. We've got to study if we're going to show ourselves as being approved of true workers for God and not be ashamed of the fact that we don't know how to do it. And also the fact we know that the scriptures, that which has been given by God unto us that were penned by human hands through inspiration of the Holy Spirit were given in order that we might be able to be furnished unto all the works necessary for the church. And so while we may not have miraculous gifts, friends, as long as we have this book, is there anything that we cannot do in serving the Lord? And shake your head this way, no, because there's not. We're absolutely able to do all that he demands of us. And so, friends, just like Paul, we're going to have to determine within ourselves that we, too, are going to live for Christ and that we're going to make that our life's number one goal. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to quit your job like Peter did. I'm not telling you you have to change your whole course of life like Paul, well, spiritually you will, but I'm talking about as far as your job because we've all got to work. We've all got to provide for our families. I understand this. I understand this. And everybody can't be a preacher and everybody can't be a missionary, but spiritually speaking, as a Christian, once we are converted, once we become a Christian, a disciple, a follower of Christ, and friends, we've got to determine that he is first and foremost above any and every other thing and every other person out there if we're going to evangelize like the apostles. A second thing we can notice in regards to Paul and some of the characteristics of which he had is the fact that Paul was courageous. And friends, this is very, very important. Now you think about the fact that at one point in time he was the great persecutor of the church, but now Paul in changing his role is becoming the persecuted. And he is probably one of the most persecuted people that we read about in the New Testament. And I know historically speaking, many people have been persecuted for their faith. But I'm talking about of those that we read about in the scriptures. Paul suffered very much over the course of his entire life, where once he was the hunter, well, friends, he has now become 
the hunted, and it started very early on in his life as a Christian because Paul, upon his conversion, after he had had his sight restored, and you remember he had been three days praying and fasting prior to Ananias coming to him. It says he took a little bit of meat, and then ultimately he went out and he began then to preach Christ in the synagogues, telling his brethren, his Jewish brethren, that Jesus was the Son of God. And friends, being a man with a strong biblical education, uh, what, well, what we would call a biblical education, Paul was able through the use of scriptures to convince many people that Jesus was the Christ just as prophecy had foretold. Because you stop and think about it. He's going to talk to Jewish brethren. He's going to talk to them concerning the scriptures in which they had. And what were those scriptures? Well, they were the Old Testament. And so he was going to reference back to the writings of, Mo of Moses, of Daniel, of Isaiah, the book of Psalms, and on and on and on. You could look at these different things that he would reference. And these would be people that it would be hard to argue with if you were a Jewish man or a Jewish woman. And so it was to the writers of antiquity that Paul would go out and he would preach and teach unto people. It was not with some blusterous appeal you know, I've seen some people, they're excellent speakers, and they can get up and, and they can really, you know, affect the emotions of people and the things and the way in which they that. But that wasn't Paul. You know, to say in 1 Corinthians 2, 1, Paul said, I didn't come with excellency of speech, nor this great earthly wisdom. No, he came declaring the testimony of God. And, of course, that was relating to Jesus Christ, the writers of antiquity. And that's why he was able to confound the Jews, it said there, while he was in Damascus because they couldn't argue with him, because he was pointing to the very word in which they professed to believe and showing them that Jesus was the Christ. After all, how was it that the Bereans, the noble Bereans, knew Paul was telling the truth? It says because they could search the scriptures for themselves and know, know whether the things he taught were true or not. And friends, it took courage to go around and to be able to do these things. You know, and though his intentions were to reach out to the lost and to help others out of their religious error, their dogma, it was with the same level of maliciousness that he once dealt out that he was oftentimes faced with himself. Because, you know, it wasn't very long after he began to preach there what happened in Damascus. They got tired of him, and they wanted to kill him, and they began to plot to kill him, and they were watching for him. But fortunately, they found out, and so what did his friends do? Well, they put little old Paul in a basket and let him out over the wall, right? Snuck away from there. So what we oftentimes look at is maybe a VBS story or something along that line. But friends, this is a real account. He was a man who was afraid for his life, afraid for his life. And so he had to escape that city. But you know that wasn't the first, or excuse me, may have been the first, but it was not the last time that Paul had to deal with any type of similar situation as this. But he did not let threats of death, threats of violence, beatings, anything deter him from continuing to do that which he knew was right and which God or Jesus had demanded of him. You think about when he went to Lystra, what happened? He was stoned and left for dead outside the city. But after he revived, what did Paul do? He went right back into the same city before he left to go back and visit some of the churches he had been at before. We talked a little bit this morning or earlier today about the Philippian jailer. He was beaten, thrown in prison. You can look at other instances. that He was afraid when he was in Ephesus. He was arrested in Jerusalem. He almost died in, in, a, in a ship, almost drowned in the ocean. He was imprisoned in Rome. I mean, on and on and on. You can go back and you can look in the New Testament in the book of Acts and read all of these things that happened to him. If we were writing a fictional tale, you know, or writing a tale about this, we might say the harrowing adventures of Paul. And it would seem like it. It would, it would compete with anything someone else could come up with today. But it was in all actuality, it was just a life of service, sacrifice, and commitment, but it was backed up by the fact that Paul was courageous. He was not afraid to teach that which was right, even though there were many people who opposed him. And friends, for Paul, in all rights, he lived his life as a soldier for Jesus Christ. He was fighting that spiritual warfare. 
And can you imagine how difficult this must have been for a man who once had the authority that he did to find himself now in the exact opposite of that situation and now being the one wary and afraid for his life? But that's the way it was. That was the case for the man who was determined to follow after the will of his Savior. And friends, I mentioned some of these things because of the fact when we look around in our society today, and I'm not saying this trying to act like it's some type of prophecy or a self-aggrandizing prediction, but friends, there may come a time in our country where we're going to have to take a stand at the risk or the threat of persecution for standing up for what's true. If you don't believe that, I would encourage you to, to pay a little bit of attention to what's happening in our society today and the things in which they're trying to convince people. Now, I would love to see nothing more than a spiritual revival in this land, and I pray for it. But, friends, history far too often repeats itself, and our country, morally speaking, is in a downward spiral right now. And I don't say that to depress us. I'm just being realistic here and thinking about the situation in which we find ourselves. For decades, decades in this land, those in authority have been trying incrementally to get a little further away from the Lord and a little further away from the Lord, and they're even doing that or doing those same types of things to, to push our young people and others away. You stop and think about some of the things in which they teach in school, and, and for decades, they've been teaching things or using the propaganda of evolution as a tool to get people to lose their faith or their confidence in God. And I say propaganda because the things in which they teach, most of it is a fraud, if not all of it. I can remember back in school, they used to teach us about Haeckel's embryos. They would teach us about Lucy, Piltdown Man, Arkansas Man, all these different things. Guess what? They're all fakes. And they were easily proven to be fakes, but they still put them in textbooks. Why? Why? because they want to get away from God. And if they convince young people, the generations coming to get away from God, it becomes that much easier to do. And so they use this propaganda. And friends, even though a lot of it cannot be proven, they turn then into the method in which they oftentimes use, and that's bullying people. Well, science has said, you're arguing against science. I'm going to be a little flippant here for a moment. There's nobody named science who's saying any of this. And second, friends, scientists don't agree that evolution is even real, much less how it takes place, supposedly. And I'm talking about macroevolution from the little single-celled organism in the slime pit that's grown into us today. And I would encourage you, not very well versed in this, to, to find some materials and to study on this because a lot of the things that they're forcing upon our children in schools and, and the movies, you know, they just came out with a new Jurassic Park movie. And I'll be honest, I took some kids and we went and watched it because we thought it'd be fun to watch some dinosaurs, pretend dinosaurs chase people around. You know, okay, all right, I get it. But friends, you, you find that, that pushing the idea of evolution as being real and things like that and entertainment and social media and our schools and our kids are being drowned by this information. And we've got to present to them knowledge or evidence that contradicts this because the things that they're pushing are just not true. They're wishful thinking. I mean, the, the theory of evolution, it doesn't even merit being called a theory because there's nothing repeatable and there is nothing testable in regards to the evolution because there is no evidence. And I'm no expert in this. I'll be honest with you. I've studied on some of it and read some of it, but there are people who are a lot more educated than I am in regards to it, but it is not true. And as bad as that in and of itself is, friends, it's only gotten worse. Yeah, you, know, you stop and think about what they're trying to do now, and that's convince us that boys are girls, girls are boys. And if you don't like who and what you are, well, you can just change with your opinion. Friends, there are perverse people from the highest levels of our government that are supporting this very type of initiative upon our children, and they're poisoning their minds and confusing them And it's sickening. It's sickening. I hate to be use such a strong word, but it's the truth. 
And as I say, you can go as high up as you want in the United States government from the president down. They're standing behind this and they're using the same tactics, that bullying mentality. Well, you're just a bigot or whatever else type of word that they want to use to say this. You know, the first time I heard something being mentioned to this, and it's been a good long, a good while back now, I thought about that old song, Lola, you know, but that was a satire. Talk about a, a guy that dressed up like a girl. You know, that was just a joke song. But friends, there are people who are trying to convince our young folks and trying to convince us that this is, is actually feasible. And they're trying to promote this in so many different ways. And it is definitely coming from toward, their, they're aiming for our youth. When you're bringing in people who dress up like women, or men who dress up like women, or men who've had sex changes, and vice versa, and you're having story time at school and in the libraries and public places, friends, they're coming for them. They're coming for them. And who's going to stand against that if not Christians? You know, it may not be necessarily here in Pulaski. I don't know. I don't live up here. It's not where I'm at back home. But, friends, it's in other places in this country. And you know as well as I do, once something starts and it gets a little momentum, it's going to come all the way across. And it'll be at our doorstep, too, one day. And so we're going to have to, might as well now be thinking about the question, what are we going to do when it does get here? Are we just going to step back and hunker down? Or are we going to be courageous? Friends, if we're going to evangelize and bring people to Christ and get them out of this secular nonsense, this perversion that's going on in the world today, then we're going to have to be like Paul. And we're going to have to be courageous. We're going to have to be like what he told Timothy we're going to have to endure some hard times as a good soldier of Christ. And, and our warfare, it's not physical. I'm not calling anyone to violence. Don't misunderstand me. But we are battling for the hearts and the minds of our people. And it's our job as Christians to do that. We're going to have to do that. And so if we're going to be like Paul, if we're going to evangelize like the apostles, friends, we've got to determine we're going to live for Christ. We've got to be courageous, but we've also, like Paul, got to be humble. And it doesn't matter whether you talk about his standing among the Pharisees or his time as an apostle. Paul was a man who was used to having some authority. So how did this man who was used to having authority, how could he be considered humble? Well, that's the thing about humility. Anyone can express humility in their life. I don't care who you are. Moses was arguably one of the greatest leaders who ever lived. But what did the scriptures say about him? It says he was the meekest man at that point in time. In other words, he was a strong man. He was a strong leader. But he also was able to exhibit humility in his life. Now, I understand there were times in Paul's when he had to exercise his authority. You think about all the trouble that was taking place excuse me, in Corinth. And he talked about the fact that he reminded them, he said, and that's just like they reminded me, I've got to hurry up. But anyway, he said, he reminded them, you know, I am an apostle. And as a matter of fact, he talked to them one time as if he were their father. He said, you want me to come to you with a rod or in love in the spirit of meekness? And so there are times when, you know, he had to exert his authority, but this was not the prevailing attitude in which Paul exhibited, friends. Paul was not a megalomaniac. He was not, you know, just obsessed with power. No, when you go back and you read all of Paul's letters in the New Testament, predominantly what do you find? You find that spirit of love and humility and concern for other people. And so that's part of the idea of being humble is being able to do that and ourselves. He was a man just like us who had to deal with his own problems of inadequacy, uh, having fears and doubts, all of these things that we all experience in our lives, and that helps to keep us humble. But the reason he was able to do that and reach out like he did is because of the fact that Paul loved people, and that's the other thing that we've got to learn or come to understand. That's why he was able to say with conviction in regards to all the things in which he had looked at before in life that he thought was so great, he said, they're just worthless. He said, I, I consider them to be rubbish in order that I might be able to gain Jesus Christ or that I might myself be able to be saved. You see, he had that same attitude that Jesus had adopted. He was willing to sacrifice everything in order to save souls of the lost. 
And so you stop and you think about these qualities that we've mentioned tonight, the idea about being dedicated or, or making a commitment of being courageous and standing up for what is truth and what is right, but being humble. We don't have to be braggarts. We don't have to go around and act like we're superior to anybody else just because we might have a little more knowledge than they do or know something that they don't know in order to convince them. No, if we're going to be able to do that, we need to express the fact that we have love for other people. You know, Paul, just consider the fact that when he began his evangelism, I know that Jesus told him he was going to have to be a witness for him before kings, but do you suppose he ever for one moment thought that he would have such a lasting impact on the world that he has had? You stop and think, he was. this is almost 2,000 years ago that Paul did his work, and still today we look at his example as a great one to be able to follow. And friends, if we can develop those attitudes that Paul had, I guarantee you that we can go out and we can evangelize like the apostles in the same spirit in which they did. And so with that, I know it's almost time. I'm going to go ahead and close out the, the lesson for today. I know the little ones are fixing to come charging back in here in just a moment, and it's going to get loud again. But I do appreciate your time this evening. I do appreciate everyone's hospitality today. You've been wonderful for all of us. I appreciate it.